Jay Hall. I'm uh, an audiologist. I'm Bob Margolis. I'm an audiologist. You know, I have a question, uh, Bob. There are other alternatives for getting a hearing test without going to an audiologist. Uh, maybe an online option or maybe, maybe an app, you know, for a smartphone. Um, and there are a number of them, actually. Why, why something like AM? Test, why not just find any old uh, available way to get a hearing test? What, how would you respond to mm -hmm. that? There, there are two problems with uh, these tests that are, you know, they started out as telephone tests and mm -hmm. then they were internet tests and cell phone tests. And mm -hmm. Main problem is calibration. Uh, we are very uh, careful about calibration in our field mm -hmm. so that we know that an audiogram done one place on a calibrated audiometer by a licensed audiologist is the same as they would get at another place. And that's because we have standards for calibration mm -hmm. and we follow the standards. That's really critical. When you have a test that's performed either over the internet or over a telephone, or, the problem is calibration. The system hasn't been calibrated mm -hmm in the manner that audio, audio, audiometers are calibrated. That is solvable, but it hasn't been solved yet. But that's the main issue right now, is that they are not calibrated, and so they are not uh, valid for purposes of, for example, diagnostic purposes or programming a hearing aid. They would not be suitable. They are screening tests. Okay and useful as screening mm -hmm. tests. Uh, but they are they are not uh, to the standard that would be required for using them the way we use audiograms in a clinical setting. The second issue with them is the procedures have not been validated. Mm -hmm. That's not a simple thing to do. Mm -hmm. We worked years uh, funded by grants from the National Institutes of Health and from the VA to validate the method and, and demonstrate that the method provides results that are equivalent to results that would be obtained by a experienced licensed audiologist. In a sound treated environment. Right. Yeah. There's no validation in those tests. There, there have been a number of papers published recently mm -hmm. that show that it is possible if you let the patient use whatever earphones they have laying around the house, well, they're not going to be calibrated. Right. But if you can control the hardware, which is inexpensive now, mm -hmm. then it is possible to, per to perform calibrated tests that way. But the calibration issue has to be resolved and the procedure has to be validated. I would assume the quality of the results is unknown with a method that, that doesn't document the quality like the AMP test. So right. uh, it, it's, uh, yeah, I think the main point to, you know, convey to the public or whomever might be using it is the difference between a diagnostic test and a screening test. Mm -hmm. so it's fine for screening, mm -hmm. but not yet uh, ready for for diagnostic purposes. Right. We're extolling the virtues of uh, automated audiometry, and uh, you know, my first reaction is, well, gosh, this is a no-brainer. Who wouldn't want to adapt this immediately and adopt it? Um, but is there any resistance, or is there any, are there any negative impressions of audiologists about automated technology that you've encountered mm -hmm. as you've uh, developed this technology and, and launched it? Yeah, you know, I, I got into this completely naive. There was a great deal of pushback. Uh, I think that really has subsided a lot for a number of reasons. These are practicing audiologists right. that were pushing back. Right. One reason is every audiologist I know is very busy. They're learning that there are ways that they can uh, manage their time more efficiently mm -hmm. and provide service to more people. And when I do presentations on this, I now, to audiologists, I always start with the data that I mentioned a minute ago. If you look at the need for 
audiograms and the capacity of the field to provide them that you can't argue with that you can't argue with it and you should not be concerned that this is going to take anybody's <laughs> no, job away that's for sure because the gap is so enormous mm -hmm. that this will is just one way to try to narrow that gap but the important thing to me was to was the quality control mm -hmm. and when you take an audiolo the audiologist out of the process what you are losing is not the ability to turn tones on and off. You're losing the expertise of the audiologist in identifying problems and then making corrections to ensure that you have an accurate result. Yeah, there is a lot of judgment. I mean, that's what makes a, a good audiologist exactly. decision making. And, and much of it is, it's so learned, it's unconscious. You don't even realize mm -hmm. you're doing it. But I thought that the cues that the experienced audiologist used to make those judgments, we could write those down and a computer could track them better than a human could. Mm -hmm. And then you could build into the system the kind of quality control that experienced audiologists bring to the process. When we were developing the uh, quality indicators for AMTAS, one of the uh, things we looked at was age because we grew up with this mm -hmm. folklore that <laughs> older people can't do well in testing hearing, they, you know, they don't do so well. Mm -hmm. Well, that turned out to be not the case. We did, our first trial was in three different centers. One was a VA hospital where there were many older patients and age was not predictive of accuracy at all. The older people, are perfectly capable of doing this test. And in fact, they, they like it a lot. And as you say, the quality indicators pick up those where there are problems. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, we'll also detect those who are willfully trying to falsify a hearing loss. Mm -hmm. I'm involved as a uh, consultant in a, a major uh, multi-site study. There are 10 sites. Um, eight of them are VA centers, the other two are military facilities. And uh, the population of participants in this study are, are veterans with mild TBI. And um, the part of the study that I'm involved in is just a tiny little part. It's uh, collecting pure tone air and bone conduction thresholds on, on the veterans and also three components of the SCAN, the uh, auditory processing screening uh, test battery. And the, the tests are all being done, all the pure tone audiometry and scan, outside of sound booths. These are not being done in mm -hmm. the VA audiology service itself. They're being mm -hmm. done elsewhere on the VA uh, campuses. Um, and we are finding that uh, a non-audiologist can very quickly become the, the quote-unquote technician to set the person up. Um, and uh, the veterans, we, we'd actually had them videotape some of the participants just to see how it would all work. Mm -hmm. The participants are, are read the instructions, follow through the, the entire task, um, and I'm monitoring quality of the data, and we're picking up some asymmetries using the AMTAS asymmetry uh, indicators, and then also the quality of service. So the system does work in that kind of uh, setting, mm -hmm. and. Um, is providing um, data that simply, there would be no other way to get it because there aren't, we couldn't get audiologists assigned to this that would be prohibited in terms of cost and they don't have the time. You know, the VA now has many uh, community-based clinics. Right. There have many more of those now than they have hospitals. Mm -hmm. And those clinics, for the most part, have no audiology services. Right. And so we set up uh, AMTAS systems in these community clinics around mm -hmm. the Nashville area, mm -hmm. your old hometown. That's right. And, uh, and then the clinic results were sent back to the hospital so that it was a store and forward telehealth system. Mm -hmm. And it worked very well. And this is a w another example of getting hearing testing in places where it's needed 
but not necessarily in an audiologist's office. Well, that solves so many problems. First of all, a veteran who may have tr transportation problems doesn't have to go to the big center. Plus, it takes the pressure off the, the audiologist in the big center uh, to, to perform other functions that they really need to. That's right. a wonderful idea. And that, uh, you know, that sh I, I hope that it's expanded nationwide because uh, there are so many rural areas where the VA is a, a, a long distance off. Mm -hmm. Presumably, most of these people just won't get to the VA for their hearing assessment as they right. should. With this uh, vet study I'm performing or consulting with the Veterans Administration in a mild TBI, that's very useful is, well, there are two. One is the very systematic definition of, of asymmetry. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, because as I teach or I'm lecturing, I'll say, well, when do you refer a patient to an otolaryngologist with concerns that perhaps their problem might need medical or surgical treatment? And, uh, of course, immediately people say, well, when there's an asymmetric hearing mm -hmm. loss. But then, of course, when you ask, well, what's an asymmetry, you'll get as many answers as there are people in the audience. Right. So, you know, this, this was something very attractive to me. One systematic, uh, well thought of definition for an asymmetry that's then immediately displayed you know, on the form that, or the screen. Right, and that's part of our, we call it the AMCLASS system, mm -hmm. which is the Automated Audiogram Classification System. When we were doing hearing evaluation, I'll bet, I'll, I'll bet the first sentence in your report was, the results indicate that the patient has a mild to moderate sensory neural hearing loss, symmetrical sensory neural yeah. hearing loss. Well, there are no standard definitions of any of those terms. <laughs> no. uh, mild to moderate, sensory neural, symmetrical or asymmetrical. So we wanted to standardize those terms. Mm -hmm. And so you could, with symmetry, for example, you could make up a perfectly reasonable definition of symmetry or asymmetry. You could say it has to be greater than 10 dB difference at mm -hmm. two or more frequencies. There's a thousand different reasonable definitions. Instead of doing that, our approach was to have a panel of experts, all of whom have been testing, hearing, and interpreting audiograms for many years, and ask them They're the judges. what's an asymmetrical mm -hmm. hearing loss. So our definition of asymmetrical hearing loss is a hearing loss that the experts say is a well, which hearing. makes sense because the system is supposed to be re representing how a, an, ex, an experienced audiologist would, would function. I mean, right. To take their thinking and put it into the, to the algorithm. Right. Yeah. We establish our rules for uh, the severity of the hearing loss, mild, moderate, severe, profound, for the configuration of the hearing loss, mm -hmm. flat, sloping, rising, trough, for site of lesion, conductive, sensory, neural, or mixed, mm -hmm. and symmetry. And then we presented a whole lot of audiograms to our panel of experts, and we asked them, is this conductive or sensory neural? Is this symmetrical or asymmetrical? So we got the results from this panel of experts, and then we tailored our definitions to agree with the experts. So the the, uh, the definition of asymmetry is the one that has the highest agreement with what the experts say as an asymmetrical hearing loss. Mm -hmm. So it's a little awkward when somebody says, so what's your definition of... Yeah, you can't cite specific frequencies right. and... I have to differences. tell them that an asymmetrical hearing loss yeah. is a hearing loss that the experts say is an But of course, audiologists hearing. can't really argue with that because they're the experts. It's, that's right. Yeah. That's right. So it's yeah. validated against the standard experts. of care and what right. people would do. Yeah. Right. You know, you hear this complaint or concern. Well, I don't want to be replaced by this automated device. Mm -hmm. And and I re actually remember in the mid 1990s, as OAEs became OAE devices became more commonplace and, and introduced in clinic. Even audiologists were worried about that. Um, and I, I guess my response, it's kind of a snide response, would be if you can be replaced by an audiometer, are you really providing valuable services? That's uh, where 
pure tone audiometry and even fitting hearing aids is not what we're all about. It's about improving people's quality of life, helping them to live independently, to uh, communicate effectively, to enjoy this world you know, that we live in, not to perform hearing tests, not even to, to um, diagnose hearing loss. It's, it's the ultimate outcome and benefit for the patient that we should be focusing on. I'm sure somewhere there's an audiologist that makes their living doing audiograms all day long. That person might be replaced by AMTAS. Um, it would be too bad for that person, but that's not what our profession is aspiring to. That's not why we became a doctoral level profession, right. to be able to do a technical test, a technical procedure that can be, that can be automated. It's not what professionals should be doing. And no other profession that I can think of, health professions, certainly in the United States, spends that much time on a simple technical task that could be done some other way. So why, should, why are we an exception? We shouldn't be.